Okay, so now we're going to look at this question of structural violence. And it comes late in the course for a very good reason. This is the concept that more than any other really radically reframes our common sense about what violence even is, what kinds of things can be called violence and what can't. Um, what, uh, and it, it really is a, a very, very deep and very, very important concept in, in the extent to which it changes the field of violent studies, but also changes our common sense in terms of, of, of how we think about the, what, what, what is even included in discussions of violence. Um, and what kinds of what, what 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 can be defined as violence, and who can be defined as being responsible for violence, which is a really really interesting question. And I've already said that I think this is the single most important concept in the course, and the one that you should really reflect on the most deeply and consider all the different examples that we're raising. The first example is a really strange kind of random and arbitrary one. A couple of years ago. A minor a hedge fund manager and CEO of a pharmaceutical company, Martin Shkreli, um, became famous on the internet for a few days and developed the nickname Farmer Bro uh, as a kind of a deliberately insulting nickname by people who were pissed off with him. So Martin Shkreli, what's he doing in of course on violence? Because he definitely committed no acts of violence. Uh, he was not accused of any, he was not convicted of any. And yet there's something interesting about it. Um, so, what's, so, so, what is, so what is it? Well, there's something really uninteresting about him because he's just another minor sort of finance industry kind of person making loads of money by doing weird things with numbers. Um, is it, so his strategy uh, as a head of a pharmaceutical company and a person interested in investments, and it's important that he's interested in investments because normally you'd think of a, a, a pharmaceutical company, well, they're developing new medicines, they're spending money on research, getting the best minds to, to, to do lab research, produce medicines, and then sell them to, to help treat diseases. That's not what his pharmaceutical company was about. His pharmaceutical company was about what all companies are about, which is making money. And he worked out a really uh, good way of making those money, that money. And it was simply buy certain drugs at a certain price, buy the, the patent rights for the drugs, and then sell, and then sell, sell those medicines for, for much more. Okay, so, so here's the strategy. Find a particular medicine um, that is not very, very widely used, but is the only medicine for its particular thing, that if people have that condition, there's not a lot of choice that they have to use that medicine. Um, and, and go to the company that manufactures the medicine and, and offer to buy it from them to say, if you sell me the patent, the right to manufacture this, um, I'll give you, <coughs> sorry, this much money. And then, Whoops. Okay. So buying the drug, drug uh, the rights to the drug at a certain price and, and then marking it up. And so his moment of fame came when he bought this drug Daraprim, which is an antiparasitic, you know, um, for, and especially useful for people who are really in life threatening uh, situations. Um, and often these are people with other complicated illnesses, people on treatment for HIV uh, or, you know, who, who, who really could become in a critical situation because of the, um, the, the, the interrelation between that health condition and others. So he buys a drug that is, you know, it's not, a, not terribly cheap already. It's about 16, 17 um, dollars a, a, a pill and marks it up to $1,000 per tablet um, in, in roughly in Australian terms. Um, so, so the drug then becomes insanely uh, expensive. But of course, this is the business model that you have people who are literally at risk of dying and they need this medicine. And so you make them pay for it. Um, and, you know, that's, that's a simple logic of capitalism. The, the price of everything is what the market will bear. Like you, you sell it for as much as people will pay for it. So, you, the, so the one thing people will pay a lot for is for stuff that will stop them dying. And you exploit that. 
Um, and it's not only perfectly legal, it's, it is the very logic of the economic system. It is, it is why CEOs get hired for the ability to do that, to, do, to work out, well, where is the little gap in the system where we can make shit loads of money? Um, and not only, you know, is that what they get hired for? That is, they, that is, they are legally actually required to do that. They are legally required to pursue the profits in the interests of the shareholders of the company. Um, and that's what he did, and he did it quite brilliantly. Um, so what were people pissed off about? Well, people were pissed off about the fact that people were going to die because of this. You know, that, that in certain countries, they wouldn't be able to prescribe those drugs anymore because the healthcare systems couldn't bear that cost. Um, that many individuals wouldn't be able to say, well, I'm, you know, I need to full course of this. I, I can't spend tens of thousands of dollars on it. I just don't have that cash. Um, and so the sense is that there's something wrong with that. There's something wrong by making yourself a multimillionaire from putting people's lives in danger. And although there may be something wrong with it, there certainly isn't anything illegal about it, not within the way our economic system is defined. Um, and so this was the interesting problem of Martin Shkreli is that he was doing he was doing his job he was doing his job very well um, and doing his job very well entailed creating a situation in which people would suffer and die um, but of course the issue there is an interesting one because he hasn't done anything wrong that there's no one who can go to the police station and say oh I know this guy has done this and cause these people to die. There's, there's, there, there's, no, there's no criminal justice system that, that can sort of conceptualize those links. There's no, there, there's no laws that, that allow a prosecution to take place under these conditions. It's just the way the system works. Um, and, this, and this is, I think, what's interesting about it. It gets even more interesting um, is, um, something else but first a little anecdote he also happened to be I don't know you know perhaps you've heard of the 1990s kind of uh, hip-hop band the Wu-Tang Clan who strangely enough didn't release one of their albums to the to the public in the normal way they, they cut one single copy and they said whoever wants to buy that one copy can buy it and they will be the only person who owns that album they can do it with it what they want um, but only one person can buy it uh, and he bought it. He bought the Wu-Tang Clan album for $2 million, um, which is really interesting. And the question is, how does that fit with his, his philosophy of wealth? Um, was it the status of owning uh, the only copy of this particular album? Uh, did he see a profit uh, opportunity that this was an investment that, he, that he'd later sell for much more? Um, whatever, the, whatever the logic of it is, um, any Wu Tan fan knows that the Wu Tan fan, the Wu Tan clan, ain't nothing to fuck with. And interestingly, Martin Scurry, very soon afterwards, suddenly ran into a lot of trouble, and ended up being given a seven-year sentence for securities fraud, which is essentially he lied to the other, the rich people that he worked with. Um, that he he misrepresented his company and their profit potentials to investors, um, so that they spent so that they invested money which they were actually not going to get the returns on, and this in itself is really interesting because it means that within the criminal justice system, you can definitely go to jail for lying to other rich people um, in a way that stops them making as much profit as they want to. But you can't go to jail for selling things at a price that means that people who need them to survive will die. And that seems to be what's really interesting about the case of Pharma Bro, is that we exist in an economic and legal system where some things are criminalized, i.e., you know, uh, misleading your investors in a way that they don't get as, make as much money as they hope to. Other things like um, making things so expensive that people die because they can't get them uh, is, is, is okay. And none of those things are called violence. 
okay, whether they're criminalized or not, the everyday notion of violence does not include anything relating to this case. And this perhaps is the exact problem that, that a bunch of people went looking at this have said, no, wait a minute. This is actually brutal. This is, we should be able to call this violence. We should be able to call taking a, a $16 drug and, 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 and selling it for a thousand dollars when people need it to survive, actually causing people to become critically ill and die. We should be able to call that violence. And this is the point of the example. And this is where we then come into the need for a new concept of violence, which works in a totally different way. So let's look at that our slide on structural violence. To understand it, we've got to understand the traditional view. The traditional view is you've got a perpetrator and a victim. You've got an aggressor who does something uh, harmful uh, to someone else who can't protect themselves effectively. The aggressor is deliberately aggressive. They, they, as a, as their strategy is to threaten harm or to actually do harm. Um, so your typical aggressor is, you know, the mugger who pulls a knife on you to make you give them the money, uh, the murderer who, who kills someone to get their insurance policy, the serial killer who goes around killing people for pleasure, um, the, 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 the rapist who attacks someone um, uses physical force um, in a coercive se sexual situation without regard to the trauma of their victim. These are models of violence that we've looked at. Um, we've also gone further than that, that we've also said, well, sometimes it's not just physical, sometimes not just, you know, the weapon, the threat of, of hurting or killing someone. Sometimes it's psychological, sometimes it's the bullying, the, the emotional impact. We've even gone further than that and we said, well, sometimes it's kind of even these <coughs> weird things like neglect. Sometimes even, you know, um, raising a child or not raising a child in a certain way can, can be harmful. And we talked about that. And we talked about how the sort of um, not meeting the developmental needs of children could, could, could place them at risk. But even then, we never really called that violence in a way that perhaps looking back, we should have. Um, and so although we've expanded our definition of violence, it seems like we haven't expanded far enough. And we need to be able to include one completely new type of case. Um, what do we do when people are harmed, but there is no deliberately hostile violent, whether that's physically or psychologically violent, aggressor who intends to threaten them, who intends to harm them, when there's no direct assault. What do we, how do we talk about, about harm where the person is harmed as a result of something else, as a result of something other than a malicious, aggressive perpetrator? How do we talk about that? Because our, our, our traditional common sense notion of violence is very stuck in this idea of the deliberate perpetrator and the vulnerable victim. But what about all the other kinds of harm that happen when, they, when that kind of perpetrator can't clearly be said to exist, okay? And there's a lot of cases like that. In fact, there are far more cases like that than there are of things like assault, homicide, um, those criminal categories of violence that we talk about. Um, and for precisely this reason, for the reason that, um, that we don't have a way of saying, well, yes, there are a lot of homicides in the world, but there are many, many more people who die from other kinds of reasons that are difficult to talk about. People who literally die of starvation because there isn't food for them or who die of illness because the medicines are not provided for them. Um, all those kinds of things. Um, that there's a lot of suffering, a lot of, a, a, a lot of injury, a lot of death that happens without 
anyone actually seeming to do it to cause the suffering or the injury or the death. Um, so structural violence then becomes the concept that is developed at this, at this point. And it's also interesting because it's very closely linked um, to the question of, um, of social inequality. So let's look uh, at our structural violence and inequality slides at some of the definitions that are being given there. And here we go um, with the first one. Human suffering caused by social structures that disproportionately benefit some people while diminishing the ability of others to meet their fundamental needs. Okay, so it's saying, okay, what we've got is we've got a social system it benefits some people, it disadvantages other people, and the people that it disadvantages specifically suffer the harm of not being able to meet their fundamental needs. And what, what fundamental needs might those be? Well, they might be very basic fundamental needs. They might be the, 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 need, the, the need to stay alive, the need to have access to water that you can drink, to have food that can give you the basic nutrition you need to survive each day. It could be the need for shelter to protect you from the harm of the elements. It could be the need to live in a safe environment, an, an environment where simply breathing the air is not so toxic that it makes you sick. Um, there could be a lot of aspects to it. But so it could have to do with the, the, the actual material conditions of physical survival, but it could have to do with other things. It could have to do with the fact that people don't just need to survive physically, they also need to, to, to survive socially and emotionally. They still need a certain amount of, 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 of kind of well-being. They still need to, to um, feel that their lives are meaningful, that, to be, that there are people there to assist them in times of crisis. Um, not to despair, not to feel hopeless and helpless. They still, there still needs to be some possibility that there will be moments of pleasure in their lives. Um, all of these might be seen um, as fundamental needs. And of course, the definitions can change in different ways. So let's look at the, the second definition there, the avoidable impairment of fundamental human needs, to put it in more general terms, the impairment of human life which lowers the actual degree to which someone is able to meet their needs uh, below that which would otherwise be possible. And here's the interesting thing, is the below that which would otherwise be possible. So I've started <coughs> phrasing this in terms of like surviving, okay? You need to, you have certain needs to survive, but you also have, a, you know, a need for, for, for a certain amount of well-being. Um, and, and here, the definition of structural violence is not that just which puts your life in physical danger, but also means that your life is less good than it could be, okay? Um, and this is the, to meet the needs below that which would otherwise be possible. And then it, it also links to the question of, well, what is possible and what is not possible? Um, and that's an important consideration we'll go back to because some, you know, some things, some things people need, but it's not possible for them to have. Um, um, and, and we need to consider that possibility. Look, look at the third quote there. Violence could be committed directly and deliberately, but could also be conducted indirectly and largely unintended unintentionally by structures populated by humans. And so what this is getting at is that these things, that people not having their fundamental needs met, aren't necessarily, they, 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 they don't require someone to do, they don't require a serial killer or a um, brutal police officer or a, um, or a, a, or a vigilante gang uh, persecuting vulnerable people. Um, or an abusive person in a relationship, they, 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 the, 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 the harm is simply a result of the, the social system in which, they, in which they occur, in which they exist, okay? And in this sense, what we've got to understand is the way in which social systems brutalize people. Social systems make people less well off than they could be, 
and that those cause certain harms. They cause harms to the person's kind of felt sense of well-being, and they create threats to their to their physical survival in certain cases. So another definition, structural violence is, is violence exerted systematically, that is indirectly by everyone who belongs to a certain social order. In short, the concept of structural violence is intended to inform the study of the social machinery of oppression. Okay, so here we're saying, okay, so the social structure creates these, these um, the, the, the way in which certain people are harmed that they are less well off than they could be, they're well, well, less well off than they need to be. Um, and essentially that the, the fact that social systems are very often organized in a way that makes some people have better lives and other people have worse lives is in fact a system of inequality and is, is in fact really a system of oppression. It's a, the system of denying people the quality of life which, which would otherwise be available to them if it wasn't being denied. Okay. And of course, there's, there's a question, well, well, part of denying it is that it is possible. You're denying something that's possible. And so Galton then, he talks about this. He says, well, we need to think about, between the, about the difference between the potential and the actual. What, what is the possible life that this person could have versus the life they actually have? And he says, the difference between the potential and the actual, between what could have been and what is okay think about the difference between what could have been and what is thus if a person died of tuberculosis in the 18th century it would be hard to conceive of this as violence since it might well have been unavoidable but if he dies from it today despite all the medical resources in the world then violence is present according to our definition okay so tb infectious disease um, largely controlled in developed countries, uh, but in many countries, it's still a huge problem. Um, it's a highly treatable disease. There are, there are medicines for it. Even the drug resistant forms of TB, there are medicines for those. And still today, lots and lots of people die from TB. And Galton's argument there is it's not necessary. Those people do not, it is not necessary in the 21st century for people to die from TB. The medicines exist. People are dying because those medicines are not being provided. Okay. Um, and there are various reasons why they're not being provided. Um, and one of those, one of those reasons is because, because these medicines are commodities that are bought and sold for a certain price, exactly as in the Pharma Bro example. Um, that some countries can't afford to make those medicines available in their um, in, in their public health systems. Some countries don't have public health systems and, and getting access to medicines is simply a, a, a brutal matter of whether you can afford them. And if you can't afford them, then you die. Um, and and, and, and that, that is a, a, a feature of that system of social uh, system. So even whether there is a public health system or not, um, is a part of the way the society is organized, a part of the structural violence of the society. Um, who gets treatments for diseases? Um, and so, so that becomes really important, but I don't want to get stuck with the example of illnesses. We talked a lot about pharma, bro. We talked a lot about TB, but there's lots of other ways that are not disease related that, that, that are examples of structural violence. Um, and and um, anthropologist Paul Farmer um, talks about this. He says, structural violence is visited upon all of those whose social status denies them access to the fruits of social and scientific progress. And those could be multiple kinds of social and, and, and scientific progress. Um, um, and for instance, in a country like Iceland, internet access is a human right, whereas in most countries that would be seen as a crazy idea. No, no one has the right to internet, but, but in that country, it's seen as your well-being, your ability to communicate to, with people, your, your ability to access important knowledge resources requires internet access, and that's fundamental to your well-being, so it's a human right. It's not a universal human right that is recognized, but it is within that context, because it's scientifically possible for people to have that. Um, so why not give it to them? Why not let them have it if it makes their lives better and it's scientifically possible at the moment? Um, now, 
the important thing to look at here then is to think about think about the ways people are harmed think about the ways in which um uh, people die because they exist in in societies where that the, the, the resources aren't available to them uh clean water isn't available to them a regular supply of food isn't available to them medicines aren't available to them but the interesting thing is they could be this is the critical question it is possible okay that everyone in the world could have enough food to eat there's no reason for the current state of affairs where 800 million people um are affected by malnutrition because they could easily be provided with food simply by spending um, a few days of the global um, military budgets on food rather than weapons would provide people what well, everyone in the world with the food they need it it would um, simply by taxing a very very small group of of multi-billionaires could provide everyone in the world with the the fresh clean and safe water that they need to drink um, but these things are not done. And because they are not done, people suffer and people die. So we need to think about that because it, it, there's something weird about thinking about that because it's like, well, we're definitely not thinking about, about perpetrators in the traditional sense, but we are thinking about failures. We're thinking about things because these, it's not because the things are done, it's because the things are not done that people suffer and die, okay? Um, and that's a really important shift that a lot, of, a lot of harm, a lot of brutalization, a lot of harm, a lot of suffering happens because of what is not done rather than because of, um, rather than because there is a malicious perpetrator who intends to be violent to another person. Um, so um, a, 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 on, our, on our fourth um, of the collections of slides, um, there may not be any person who directly harms another person in the structure. Okay, there's not a person who directly harms another person. The violence is built into the structure and shows up as unequal power and consequently as unequal life chances. Resources are unevenly distributed. Above all, the power to decide over the distribution of resources is unevenly distributed. So think about that. It's not just that there, you know, some people, you know, have everything they need, have fantastic health care, eat wonderful food, live in safe environments, protected by anti-pollution laws, uh, protected from unsafe buildings by building codes, uh, but other people aren't. Other people don't have enough nutrition. Other people are forced to, 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 to live in areas that have been contaminated by factories, are forced to live in in, 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 in shelters that are unregulated, dangerous, where there are fires and collapses of buildings, um, where, where, where diseases spread because um, basic medical resources are not provided, um, where they aren't protected from gangs and criminals because there isn't a social infrastructure of um, law and justice, all of those things. But it's not just that those inequalities exist. Um, so, th so the violence is, is, is not just in the fact of the inequalities, but, but the power to decide on those inequalities is itself unevenly distributed. Who decides? Who gets to decide whether it's a crime for farmer bro to rip off his shareholders or farmer bro to price the drugs so high that people, sick people die? Some people get to decide on that and others don't. Um, and this is precisely the, the problem. Um, vulnerable, vulnerable people, people likely to get sick, don't have the same power to define the laws as, 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 as millionaires and billionaires do, as, as people who, 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 who make their billions by being shareholders and companies. Those people can, can influence politics. Um, those people can make sure that, that that misleading your shareholders is a criminal offense you can go to jail for. Whereas, for instance, people in developing countries dying en masse from tuberculosis, parasites, um, other preventable conditions don't have the power 
to make sure that their deprivation and suffering is criminalized. And this is really, really important. The power to decide over the distribution of resources is unevenly distributed. And, and that is how those systems of harm get perpetuated. So what's clear about the notion of structural violence, it doesn't require the traditional notion of a bad guy. It doesn't require malicious intent, it doesn't require what, what in, in sort of you know, classical legal terms, a mens rea, the, the evil mind, the, the intent to do harm. It simply requires a system that carries on being in a way that, acts, that, that, that hurts people. Um, um, and, and it's very clear that globally we exist in such a system, and not only globally, but individual countries, individual social systems exist in ways that hurt and harm vulnerable groups. Um, and one of the big features of this, when you look at a global level, one of the big features is the economic system, that we exist in an economic, in an economic world that 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 allows for certain things that 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 allows for um, a group of about forty people to own as much wealth as half of the entire world's population. That those forty people own as much wealth as three and a half billion other people. And the fact that of those three and a half billion other people, many of them are in very dire conditions. They aren't living the kind of middle class lives that we are. Um, they're living in conditions of brutal poverty, of high risk. And many of them are actually in the very process of dying from, um, from not having the resources they need. And, 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 and when I say many, we're literally talking about a, around a billion people, around a thousand million people who, whose lives are in, in jeopardy in ways that they don't need to be. It's a function of an economic system that came into being uh, and that is kept in being by political systems, by distributions of power. So i quote there, the behavior of, uh, of elites cannot be reduced to ordinary motivations like greed or domination, as greedy or domineering as they may be. When we're talking of class interest and of how individuals become personifications of great institutional forces, all the innumerable variations that make the human psyche interesting are subject to a few basic rules and a remarkable uniformity of behavior prevails. Okay, so what's being said there? Once again, what, what, what's being said, it, it, it doesn't, it's not just that sort of individual people are kind of psychopaths, that they are, that they are perversely greedy. It's simply that a social system comes into being in which people simply by participating in the, what, what's normal in that social system, simply by saying, well, I'm a CEO, my job is to ensure that my company does well financially, and that involves me selling the drugs for as much as I, I possibly can. Um, and, and that everyone participates in and, and agrees in that. And for instance, think back to our question, when we're looking at gender-based violence, we're looking at sexual assault, the traditional approach focuses on the, the individual sexual offender, this rapist, this, the, what kind of, of depraved person becomes a rapist? And we can ask that question, but there's another question that we ended up asking, which is the question of rape culture. Um, the question of what kind of system makes people think that rape is even a possible activity that puts them in a position where they would be like, oh, I want to do this, I'm going to do it. Um, it's um, um, where, where, where people get away with it. So you remember when we're looking both at Audrey and Daisy, it wasn't just the, these young boys who were, they were, and there wasn't anything particularly crazy about them. They were doing things that were, that had been kind of normalized, taking advantage of, 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 of drunk girls. Um, was kind of normalized within that system. And not only was normalized there, it was normalized within the criminal justice systems. You have the sheriff saying, well, was a crime even really committed here? You know, a couple of guys like, you know, kids were drunk, having sex. Um, and, 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 and then the bullying of the, of, of the victims and of their families. 
um, that, 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 that's an entire system, the, the, the social system, which made the, those, those sexual assaults possible. Similarly, when we looked at that example of, of, of uh, Father O'Grady and Cardinal Pell, that the, that the church had, had, had created a system where priests could get away with abusing children. And on the one hand, the criminal justice system is interested, okay, this individual priest committed these acts and can we prove that? But we need to say, but what about the system? What about the system of covering up for other priests? What about the system of, of making people sign non-disclosure agreements, of lying to the public? What about that as a, as, as, as a system? That is a structurally violent system. Um, beyond the individual violent acts of the of, of the individual perpetrators, um, and here's the interesting thing, and this is what this is where we reach the big problem with structural violence, is if a system is structurally violent, it's not only the people who who enact what we think of as normal acts of violence, simply by being normal within that system, simply by behaving the way an, an, a regular person behaves in that system, you're harming other people. This is, this is the challenge of structural violence, that the fact that we can, be, we can be harming others by just living our lives in a particular way. And what does that mean? So let's think about some examples of that. And this, this lovely quote from Rebecca Solnit, um, that uh, is the title for our next slide. The revolt against brutality begins with a revolt against the language that hides that brutality. So, so to understand the harm being done some, by, by something, we need to first of all have a language for showing that it is harming people. We've got to have a, a, a concept, we've got to have a theoretical framework for showing that. And that's why I've been stressing for the, for throughout the course that we need to think about our, our concepts, we need to think about our theories, we need to think about our language, we need to think about our explanatory systems, because they make certain things appear not violent and other things appear violent. Is hitting your kids violent or not? Is it is it responsible child rearing or is it child abuse? I mean, this depends on the language, on the concept, on what we know, on the studies that have been done. Um, so the, the, the point we've made up till now is that simply allowing a social system that harms people to exist makes each of us responsible for that structural violence. And the responsibility is in the form of negligence, okay? that we are by acts of negligence responsible for the harm done by that social system. The issue is not who created the social system, rather the issue is who benefits from the social system. Um, and it's interesting. So for instance, if you look at, look at you know, at the, the system of colonization, that, 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 that at a certain point, the, the West colonized countries around the world. It colonized Australia, it colonized the United States. Um, and that was an incredibly violent process, okay? They colonized because they had guns, because they could kill the indigenous people um, of those lands, because they could, they could use brute force to, um, to, 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 to take control of the land, to take control of the resources. What they typically did then, not only did they, they kill people in that process, kill people in, in, in huge numbers, they also stripped people of their, 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 their means of life, of the, the, the land that, 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 that was their well-being, the, the land that was the resource that made them able to live. They also then often imposed um, these systems, which, which, which then dehumanized the people whose land that they stole, and they, they imposed systems of racism that excluded people from certain areas, from certain forms of employment, from certain human rights. Um, and so, so, so although it's, it starts as a physically violent process, it also ends up being a process of, of harming people without necessarily shooting them with guns harming them simply because what they needed to survive, their land, they don't have that land anymore. Harming them by creating a social system which, which other people have human rights and dignity and resources and indigenous people don't. 
um, that, that system is violent and that system comes out every day still, you know, hundreds of years after the initial colonial brutality was exercised by brute physical force. It, it, it comes out as, as forms of violence, as, as, as um, communities that are dysfunctional um, and, and have become caught up in, in, in cycles of exclusion, of poverty, of, of interpersonal violence um, because of the deteriorated states of that social infrastructure. Um, but the issue there is that it's not just the people, who, the colonizers who were violent, and certainly they need to be held responsible, but the people who, can, who, who still benefit from that, the people who benefit um, simply because that social system works very nicely for them, simply because their families now own houses on that land, simply because that social system allows them to work and earn a certain salary. Um, all of those, all of those are, are, are benefits um, that are that that are linked to certain kinds of harms. The trouble is that the kinds of harms that they link to are externalized; they're not visible. So, so you know, simply by living in a, 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 a you know an ordinary house with an ordinary garden, um, the fact that that is built on the a, a historical process of dispossession, or simply going into a shop and buying um, an item of clothing that conceals the fact that the, the fact that that clothing is affordable is only possible because a sweatshop exists in some developing country where, where underage women are being uh, forced into brutal labor conditions, dangerous labor conditions, being unpaid that, 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 that really put them at both emotional and physical risk. Um, and that's why, that's why the t-shirt costs $5. Um, that within the, with, with, within the system, it's not who's doing the violence. The person buying the t-shirt is not, is, is, is not the perpetrator of the violence, but they are the beneficiary of the violence. The person living in the house, not the perpetrator of the violence, but they're the beneficiary of the violence. Um, and that's a very different way of thinking about it, of thinking about what it means to benefit from a structurally violent system. Um, what it means to that 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 for this system to exist, for a certain standard of living to exist, for the economy to grow in a certain kinds of way, means that other people elsewhere, people who are generally not visible, are are suffering as a result of that. Um, and what's interesting is um, the way one of the, the, the there's a number of challenges to even thinking about what to do about about structural violence the first is the difficulty in showing that it even exists to to even get to the point of saying in fact the system is structurally violent in fact when you walk into target and buy a t-shirt that there's a structurally violent system there this is not just a neutral shopping experience um, there were conditions of production behind that um, when you walk into Coles and 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 buy a steak, that is not it, it's not just a commodity that it magically appears. That there was there was suffering behind that. Um, that 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 sentient creatures were harmed in that process. Um, and so the first thing is to to even be able to 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 show that such a system exists. That there's a link between um, you know, the the battery farming of chickens, sweatshops in the third world, um, acts of hostility by Western powers in in in, in the Middle East, um, that 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 that, that ex those exist as systems of structural violence, um, and and that they are brutalizing, that they are harming people, they and not only perhaps people, but but other creatures that are capable of suffering. So the third thing that is important to identify there is that that system is not justified, because that's one of the big the, the the big things that that social systems do. They they present themselves as normal, natural, and inevitable. So firstly, it's it it exists just because that's the way the world would that's the way the world exists. It's a, it's a, it's a feature of its pure material nature that it exists like that. Um, secondly, um, that it's it's that, that that existence is kind of natural. So there's no point talking about it. 
because you know men just aren't actually aggressive they're going to be sexually aggressive towards people when they have the opportunity to be or 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 that um that um that the state of affairs that the capitalist economic system is just the only economic system that kind of works and so some people are going to have to be exploited um so 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 firstly showing that it exists but but mostly showing that it is it is not natural that it has been created and because it's not natural we can then ask given that it was created is it justified and this is the this is the third big difficulty is showing that the system of structural violence is not justified and the first the third is has got to do with the fact that the systems generally claim themselves to be inevitable well it's just it just has to be like that. Um, and, and so the challenge in identifying structural violence is say this system could be different. People do not have to pay a thousand dollars a tablet for that antiparasitic drug. People in developing countries with, met, with tuberculosis can be given effective treatments. The, the, the 800 million people suffering from malnutrition in the world can be provided with food actually very easily. Um, all of these things are doable. And most of them are actually on a, on a sort of practical, on a scientific level, they're very easily doable. The difficulty in doing them is on the social level. The challenge to, doing, to, to getting rid of that, of, of that structural violence, that, that harm and suffering that's built into the social system is not a practical scientific problem. It's a political problem. It's a problem of who's benefiting from that system and the power that the beneficiaries have to, to stop that system changing. That's the problem. And that's why we, when we talk about structural violence, we talk not about perpetrators, but about beneficiaries. Who has the power? Who has the interest in maintaining the social system? And those are the things we need to think about. Okay, so let's conclude just by, by looking at, at some examples. If we're thinking like this, well, what are examples of structural violence and, and, and what, what, what aren't? Um, and one of the topics that has come up recently is the question of the COVID pandemic. Okay. Um, the, and the suffering and death um, caused by the COVID pandemic, um, is it necessary? Can it be different? Um, and then we, we, and we see certain kinds of things. Um, for instance, one of the things we see is, is COVID denialism. We see people who claim it's, it's not really a serious uh, illness. And we see that those people have very specific political and economic interests often. We see um, uh, in, in denying it, that, 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 their, that their interests, their political interests, their economic interests of saying, well, we can't shut down the economy, uh, you know, people will lose their jobs. But what they're really saying is that we can't stop, stop people going, going to work because our profits will be affected. Therefore, we will deny the seriousness of the pandemic in order to protect our profits. Um, what about people engaging in unsafe behavior? Um, people who are, um, uh, you know, not, not protecting others, not wearing masks, going, breaking social distancing rules, hanging out with their friends in a, in a way that potentially could tra transmit the virus. Um, is that a kind of structural violence? Um, is, 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 is doing stuff that, that may lead to more people being infected, more people becoming sick, certain people becoming uh, chronically disabled, other people dying. Is that an act of structural violence? Well, it seems that it is. So simply being careless, simply being like, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure it's fine to do this. That, that then in, in a sense becomes an act of, of structural violence. Uh, simply prioritizing the economy over people's lives becomes an act of structural violence. Of course, it's complicated as it always is because you can also say, well, the, the economic costs of taking certain, of adopting certain strategies is, is structurally violent. The, the violence of, of people losing their jobs and perhaps then um, losing the, the resources they need to survive or, or the uh, mental health costs of social isolation, all of those could be seen as, as, as types of structural violence too. Um, 
but 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 let's move on to to sort of more kind of global examples that we've discussed already. We, we've already we've already pointed out that you know although we get our, we we our criminal justice system sort of focuses on things like homicide and our international laws kind of system of justice focuses on things like genocide. Those things, homicides and genocide kill very, very few people compared to starvation and lack of medical resources. Um, and for a particular reason that homicides are seen as being done by someone, genocides are being done by a particular group, but, 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 but people, people suffering and dying in those other ways where there isn't an active agent um, those get spoken about as oh that's just how the world is you know it's just it's 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 just it's it's just an inevitability um, those people are starving because there's a famine not there's a famine because food is not being distributed uh, to people who need it and it could be distributed the food exists the distribution logistics exist it's just not being done same with the medicines okay but wherever there's inequality. Um, there's a risk that there's structural violence. So when we talk about the, 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 the existing, the well-documented um, forms of inequality, racism, sexism, homophobia, xenophobia, classism, it's very clear that all of these things actually are implicated in structural violence. What's interesting is that they're not just deprive people of their rights. It doesn't just mean that people of certain race or ethnicity or national origin don't don't get certain rights. That they don't have the same opportunities they 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 um, as others. Um, but also that there's an interesting link between those inequalities and acts of physical violence. So we start seeing, you know, um, people being assaulted because of their national origin. Um, we start seeing racist violence um, uh, in certain countries by the authorities, by the police. Um, we start seeing not only the violence of sexism, um, women being denied certain opportunities, certain rights, certain safety, but, but also leading to them being having an increased chance of being physically victimized in relationships or sexually assaulted. Likewise, uh, homophobia, not only are gay people, you know, denied certain rights in certain contexts, the right to marriage, the, you know, the right to, to love who they love, but, but also being subjected to physical homophobic assaults, gay bashing. Um, so, so often there's an interplay between structural violence and physical violence, that the system of structural violence often has one of its consequences that it also allows physical violence towards vulnerable groups. It doesn't always, but it's a, a surprisingly common pattern. Um, and so we need to think about that. We need to think about to say, like, you know, I mean, this that that recently, you know, the the referendum about about gay marriage. Um, I mean, even the, the the fact that 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 same sex marriage was not allowed, that was a form of structural violence. The fact that people were allowed to vote on other people's right to marry was a form of structural violence. Um, it harmed people. It deprived them of their rights, or deprived them of their well-being. Um, and these things continue to happen. And of course, they happen. Um, one of the one of the most sort of striking examples is they happen with respect to to refugees, and the fact that asylum seekers are are routinely de deprived from their most, most basic human rights um, and subjected to sort of um, imprisonment without ha having been convicted of, of any crime. Um, so all of these are, 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 are important interplaying things. But, but when, we, when we look at it, and this was why we sort of focused on a number of other reasons, Structural violence doesn't only apply to human beings. Um, it surely then applies to all creatures that are capable of suffering. Okay, um, that anything, any, 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 any sentient creature that that suffers, that suffering can be thought of as being violent. You know, and whether that suffering is kicking a puppy, or whether that suffering is keeping literally billions of animals under conditions that amount to torture um, in order 
that people can eat certain food and pay a certain price for it. For instance, that chicken is cheap. The fact that chicken is a cheap and readily available foodstuff is because there are 7 billion chickens that are kept not in the conditions which they've evolved to be kept in, but they get kept in essentially conditions that amount to constant lifelong torture, that the, that the, the, the density um, uh, of, uh, under which they kept in battery farming conditions, the lifestyles they lead, it's not simply that they are killed for human consumption, it's, it's that, that animals like pigs and, and um, chickens actually are, are forced to exist under condition, conditions of, of, of constant suffering. Um, that could be could be argued to be a kind of torture. Certainly, it can be argued that 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 that, that those are not the optimal conditions for them. That that they're being deprived of the very things that 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 could give them well-being. And that, if you go back, remember that is that is really core to our definition of structural violence. So, structural violence certainly applies to the. Um, the, the treatment of animals, and it's not just that animals are are kept under torturous conditions for human consumption. It's also that environments are destroyed. That in order to you know have things like palm oil as a, a widespread food additive, or in 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 order to have um, certain foodstuffs available cheaply um, through mechanisms of mass agriculture, that 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 that, that natural habitats have to be destroyed. They have to be destroyed massively. And so we see the situation at the moment that in the last 50 years, 60% um, of all animals on earth have been killed um, um, because, be, because of the way the, the system of, of, of production and consumption works, because of the way in which the, 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 the destruction of natural environments um, proceeds because people want uh, more space for cheap uh, industrial scale farming, more space for urban development, um, more space for, for, um, uh, for more use of natural resources, uh, de deforestation because they need Either the space or or, or 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 the or the wood from the forests, all of those kinds of things constitute these systems of destruction, um, which normally couldn't be thought about as violent, but from a structural violent point of view, become incredibly important. And of course, then the big big question when one looks at structural violence, one of the arguments made is is that the, that perhaps the greatest form of structural violence at all is the literally the destruction of the viability of the human race as a species existing on earth um, which is the long-term consequence of global warming that essentially not only are there already immediately people in certain countries that are being subjected to weather conditions bushfires flooding people are being killed um, already on a regular basis because of, of, of the instabilities and extreme weather events resulting from, from climate change, but that our current trajectories are headed towards uh, drastic uh, changes in the livability of the planet for future generations and livability both for, for, for humans and for all other creatures. And so there's this, this epic catastrophe that is well known by scientists, um, and and the the sense in which that the simply simply doing what we are doing, simply you simply you know driving cars, eating meat, um, mass having commodities mass produced that we want to buy, you know, upgrading cell phones every two years, putting on buying new clothes every season. Um, being able to fly to places we want to visit, or that that entire system is built necessarily at the moment on a system of fossil fuel extraction, um, and 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 that system is is creating these harms. The interesting is that they're deferred harms. They're harms that we will pay the price for in the future, but they but but in most places there's a lack of political will 
to say, well, we don't want to, we don't want to cause people to suffer and die in that way. Um, because to do that might mean that that um, life might become less luxurious for all of us. And certainly it will become less profit, profitable for the elites, for the multi-billionaire kind of classes that, who, whose, whose wealth um, depends on that. And for the political classes whose well-being depends on um, the, the benefits they receive from from supporting those particular economic groups. And, and here Australia is an, an interesting key offender because the, the, the lie that is often told is that, you know, the fossil fuels used in Australia by Australians amount to a negligible contribution to global warming, like 4% contribution to global warming. So there's not really much that could change, but of course that, that's deliberately meant to, to deceive the fact that Australia is the third biggest exporter of fossil fuel producing materials that after Russia and Saudi Arabia, Australia produces the third most coal and gas in the world that is being sold on to produce, um, to produce carbon emissions to increase global warming. And so it's not simply that individual Australians are driving their cars too much or turning their heating too high that essentially they're part of a political system that benefits from that economic logic, that, that, that it is one of the wealthiest countries in the world because its economy is built on the extraction and sale of these cl climate change producing raw materials and that everyone benefits from it. And um, everyone benefits from the, the construction of such a wealthy society in which they are then hundreds of thousands of other decent jobs that are made possible, that there's funding for school and schools and hospitals that, are, that is made possible precisely because of the, the profits that are generated by, by those industries and the fact that then they, that produces a, a broad flourishing economy. Um, and of course, there are alternatives, um, there are well-documented alternatives. And, and, and as I'm saying, this has just been a political fight about the, the ruling party's decision to invest in, in gas rather than renewables. And the renewables could also support economic development um, in a sustainable way, in a way that didn't produce uh, structural violence, that didn't produce uh, um, calculable harms to future generations, but they've decided not to um, because of their close ties to certain industries, because certain political parties are connected to certain industries and, 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 and there's converging interests there. Um, but these are all examples of, 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 of things where what, what is being done either is harming or will in the future definitely cause harm to people. And it could be done differently. Um, these are choices that are made, but mostly they're choices that aren't made. They're things that carry on happening, not because, almost never because someone decided that what they want is to hurt someone. They want someone to suffer. They want, you know, they, they, they want future generations to suffer and die. They want people in developing countries to be exploited. They want chickens to be brutalized their entire lives. No, nobody wants that. There aren't sadistic, psychopathic perpetrators who want that. People are just okay with things as they are. Things as they are are nice. Um, driving a car is nice. Buying stuff at the supermarket is nice. Um, and it's simply the fact that it's easier not to look, it's easier not to investigate whether the niceness of things is in fact built on systems that necessarily cause harm to other people, um, in fact, to other, other sentient creatures even, and whether it's possible to choose not to do that, to choose not to participate in the systems of those of, of creating that harm and to choose to participate in systems that attempt to reduce and move away from those forms of structural violence.